Hey guys, welcome back to a new episode of Something Wicked Podcast. I'm joined, as always, with my heterosexual life partner, Rob. And we're joined by Mark Price, the director of Dream Drifter and Colin. Uh, so yeah, we're just going to ask Bob some questions about his career. And yeah, do you want to take it away then, Mark? Like, just tell us like, how you got into it. Obviously, you must be a horror fan with Colin, because that film was busting. So yeah, how did you get into it? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I love horror. Uh, I think I, I grew up, uh, I think the first time I saw Dawn of the Dead, was my uncle had lent me uh, heat taped I'm gonna get you sucker off, uh, yes, off uh, I think of the Sky movies and no, it was I, like I, film, wasn't it? yeah yeah it was, it, I, I wish I still I still love it and uh, and after that there was Ghostbusters because when the tape ran out and it wound down it was the end of Ghostbusters so I watched the end of Ghostbusters and then he was obviously channel surfing after he was watching Ghostbusters because that was how the skybox worked right so you take the channel surfing and uh, and he and it went on to it had just missed the title of Dawn of the Dead, so I didn't know what it was called, and I just saw basically, uh, you know, Galen waking up, and then all that happening, and then the tape ran out and it stopped. I went, oh, how am I going to find out what this is? And I think Movie Drone, was it Movie Drone, the Alex Cox show? Uh, that was where I finally said, "What's Dawn of the Dead?" And it came on. I went, "Oh my god, this is that film I've been looking for for the last few years." And uh, yeah, I, I fell in love with with zombies, uh, but I've always sort of loved horror. It's been it's been the genre that I think my parents weren't into, so as a result, I didn't get to see them. Um, it wasn't like ever a case of oh, you're not allowed to watch that; you're too young. I mean, we watched Robocop. Uh, we were eight for some bizarre reason, uh, but yeah, horror films just weren't their thing. And if they were, I would have seen more of them. Uh, so I was told about horror films, so I got to picture them before I saw them. And then I eventually started, you know, caught up and watching Nightmare on Elm Street and that sort of thing. And it was, yeah, had a great time. Do you, uh, do you remember the first horror film you watched? I always think it's, I think it's Alligator. The, um, uh, cool. Yeah, I, I think like, yeah, I think it might've been Alligator because I, I remember that being, because I, I guess, because I've never really, like Jaws doesn't really, I, that's not really, I don't know, I guess there's a debate as to whether that's a horror film or not, but it seems like, a, it, it seems like, I mean, like a, 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 a film like Alligator felt just so like, I shouldn't be watching this. And Jaws was one of more of a sort of like, oh, I gotta show my mum that I'm not scared otherwise she'll turn her off. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think that, uh, I, th I think Alligator. And I remember being really shocked when the guy was pulled out of the water and his legs were bitten off. It's a, uh, a lot more gritty, isn't it, Alligator, than Jaws? I was, I've, never, I've, never, I've never seen... I always, I, but as a kid, or a younger person, I used to get confused with Alligator and Eaton Alive. Eaton Alive's a Toby Hooper one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I always get them confused, like, they all never mentioned in two films together. Yeah. yeah I've John, seen John, from that. John Sayles uh, wrote uh, Alligator, I think, and, uh, yeah, he's, like, and, yeah, he's just a, a great... He's a great writer. Like, I, I'm really fond of Battle Beyond the Stars, another one that he wrote. Um, and it's just like a really clever, taut film with really great tension and a an eight-year-old getting eaten in a swimming pool, being forced to walk the plank and he sees the alligator and his friends don't, they push him in anyway. It's horrible, it's brilliant. With, with Colin, obviously, so, because Colin was, was your first sort of branch out into movies, wasn't it, sort of thing? Yeah. How was it you sort of became like involved in filmmaking? Um, I think, uh, I think uh, with, with 28 Days Later, I think the landscape had changed a little bit. Uh, and, and then you sort of had the like indigent films, which were sort of shot on DV, like Pieces of April, uh, films like that. I remember thinking, oh, I'm gonna, because I didn't want to make a uh, found footage film. I, I, I love found footage films. I, I don't like, I, 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 there's no judgment here. I really, really enjoy them. But uh, what I love about film is the, the style. And that was what I wanted to do with a film I was making. And so, uh, with that and I, I, with that sort of little revolution, I thought, oh, I might just make a movie using this camcorder, which I can afford. Uh, and that was how we did it. So, uh, and I didn't actually, it, the first film I made, I actually just threw it out. I didn't finish it. It was, um, it was, uh, it was a thriller. It wasn't a horror. I was intended to be a thriller. It wouldn't have been thrilling. Uh, so I, uh, and I used this one of those things where I shot it and I, I realized, wow, I'm, I'm not very good at this. I need to be better. And so I, I ditched it and then uh the idea for Colin came coincidentally after we'd watched I think it was the uh it, it was a cut of Dawn of the Dead that I hadn't seen at that point uh which is that that amazing DVD box set that's really rare now 
I, I bought that and I can't remember what version I hadn't seen at the time, but we watched that one night and I woke up the next morning and thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have a zombie movie just from the zombie's perspective? And you could do it in London because I know when it's quiet and where you can go to make it look desolate. And we can do like lots of really cool things like knock the sound down and build the sound up and, and, and control those things because I don't have a microphone to record sound. So uh, there's all these little things that we came up with that I thought would be quite handy to, to yeah, to, to make to make that film. And I remember saying to my friends, oh, what do you think of this? And they go, oh yeah, that would make a good short film. I was like, no, 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 it would be a feature film. <laughs> and yeah, like, it's it an hour and 37 minutes, isn't it, the film? It is, yes, yes. Yeah. That seems to be my number. I seem to have a couple that land at about 97 minutes. Um, yeah, well, I've, no, I've noticed that recently. It's quite weird. Because uh, obviously with Colin, obviously it's very famously known for having a budget of like, Forty-five pounds, apparently, according to the report you've read. Forty to fifty. Forty to fifty. <laughs> and, Seventy um, bucks. Like, and to make me, I, I, I was in um, college doing films myself, and I remember when we made some short movies. Yeah. The cost, we, were, we must have been quite, I don't know, really into it. We paid much more than that, and we were only twenty to thirty minutes long. So when That's I saw right. that, so when I watched Colin myself, and I thought, how's he done this at forty-five or forty fifty? Yeah. It really shocked me. Well, I am. Um, I uh, the the effects. I just want to commend you for because the, the effects in that, like especially, I think it was one of the first kills you see, where is it? Colin bites the lip off someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and that effect, considering you didn't spend that much money, I thought. Do you have a background in special effects or anything? What's the? No, there was. We had an amazing makeup artist, Michelle Webb, and, and she was like, "Hey, there's this stuff called liquid latex," and so I was like, "Oh, tell me more." And so she showed me a couple of things and. We had a load of makeup people come down actually for the for our first day, and I wanted to start big. So we did. There's a sort of like a, a scene where there's loads of people in a house, and there's loads of zombies in a house, and a few people are sort of like trying to. They basically got into their their student digs, and I remember leaving a little camcorder on the floor as a little, which is funny enough, the camera we shot the film on, because uh, we had two camcorders. Uh, that one has that one has a dead pixel, so we. So if you look at the film, sometimes there's a dead pixel in the bottom right corner. And it's when we were swapping between cameras. Um, and uh, I don't think QC caught it, because so I think it's on Apple still. And QC haven't kicked us off for it yet, so I think we're all right. But I, actually, it's, it's with, with their dead pixels in the new Zack Snyder uh, zombie film as well. So it's like, it's like we, were, we were ahead. We were, we were well ahead. Like, <laughs> Zack Snyder, that, that, come, on, come on, Zack Snyder, with all your millions of... And early on in his film, <laughs> of course, early on in his movies as well, he was doing zombies as well, wasn't he? He was doing the remake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which is a which is great, and I watched it recently. It's really really great. Um, I rewatched it recently. It's really great. Well, yeah. So we were shooting that scene first, and all, of all the makeup people that kind of came, I think it might have been a bit overwhelming. And 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 I hadn't run made a film before, so I didn't really know things like you know, oh, I've got to get food for everyone. Oh, okay, because I kind of like I was I was kind of like, oh look, guys, we, we don't have any money. If anyone wants to look out for yourselves, and I think that I yeah, I might have fucked up a little bit there, which is really really bad. Um, but uh, you know, a, a couple of them remained really good friends that kind of understood and went, oh, it's because you don't have a fucking clue what you're doing. That, okay, fine. <laughs> and they were really nice about it. And they showed us a couple of things, came down on some big days. And yeah, so like Michelle Webb being our main, uh, our main guru, she's amazing. She showed me how to do a few things. And uh, yeah, with the lip bites, that was, um, that was just liquid latex on, on it looked, it looked great. It looked really good. Like, when I was watching, cause this is, I think the first time I watched Colin, I think I was still in high school. Don't yeah, yeah. it makes me make yeah. feel old or anything. But I remember watching it with my mum. I think I can't remember what we were watching it on. Um, and I remember seeing it back. I think, oh, this is really cool, this. And I watched it the other night. It still stood up. And oh, I really? think it's like 10 years later. And I, thought, oh, it's, I still think I thought it looked really good, the effect, like with the lip being oh. bit off. Thanks, man. Because I, I I can't watch it when it when it came because it's uh, just been uh, submitted to the BFI. Uh, they, they they sort of got in touch with me and asked could they archive it for you know uh, for future generations. That they, they I think because it was made so low budget, they said oh there's you know there's there's some 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 cultural significance to this <laughs> bedroom movie you made. So we want to put it in our archives, which I'm like was so excited about. And I had to shuttle through it. I I can't I can't watching it. It makes me. <gasps> It really makes me nervous. Um, and it's, it's not that I don't love the film and it's like I've got it in the way that you love a film you, you make and there's, it's a part of you, right? Um, but my ability to watch it is, is, long, is, is long gone. I just, I just don't, I don't know if I could do it again. I'm going to have to at some point before I die. When but, was the last uh, time you watched it then? I, I'm going to say the recording the commentary for the DVD. 
I'm ready. <laughs> that was the last time I watched it. So well, I, Colin on Amazon Prime. So anyone, is, anyone who actually watches this, anyone who wants to watch Colin, Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime, Prime yeah. Oh, sweet. There we go. I, I was uh, pleasantly surprised when I found it. I told you, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right, yeah. yeah. obviously, we want to revisit it for this podcast, and we thought, well, there it is. Oh, amazing. I, you know, I didn't know that. That's the thing as well. I don't really... I don't look, I, I kind of, I kind of just go, okay, that's there, let's go. And you know, I, I, I'll talk about it endlessly. Uh, but yeah, it, it was, and the lip gag was only a bit of liquid latex. And cause I knew Alistair and Craig Russell, like they were good mates. I said, look, it's going to be like quite a bizarre, intimate kill. Uh, and this is how we're going to try and do it. So uh, like I had, I remember having to animate the frame of him falling and landing on that thing, but he's there the whole time. And I think I, I crushed the blacks. But if you look very carefully, He's, he's all curled up waiting to, and then he just throws his arms out and Al was in front of him. And it kind of was like a really cheap little gag that sort of worked. And then in a single shot, because we were losing the light, we, we managed to get that. Because there's no permits, we just went to that area and shot it, which I walked past on my way home from the tube in uh, Collier's Woods at the time. And oh, that looks pretty cool. We'll kill a guy there. Something on the, uh, the watch um, of it we, of this week that I took from it. Um, that, have you ever seen the, um, the BBC um, show? Well, it wasn't a show, it was a one off called Threads. I actually, I very recently watched Threads. I watched Threads, um, I think just last year, and I've seen it about four times since. Uh, it's one of the best things I've ever seen. Yeah, because I only yeah. saw it about a couple of years ago, and to be fair, it terrified me. I mean, it looks you know, of its time, dating and things like that. Yeah. But you know what, it's, you know, it, it's, it works. It works, it's the human works. emotions of the characters. And this is what I got from Colin, that the relationship with Colin and his sister, and, um, yeah. you know, like, and the realism of it all, like, say, me, Colin, like, say, you know, it, it, it does deal with, like, you know, because Colin, though he is a zombie, there is a human side to him. You kind of root for him all the yeah. way through. I mean, you know he's, he's a zombie, technically the bad guy. Because he's not, because he, Colin, you know, he's not trying to, he's trying to keep away from trouble. Obviously he finds himself in situations, like with yeah. it be in the basement and things like that, but um, at the party, but at the same time, he's actually trying to just do the right thing. I think what, what I tried to do was create it so that those things are brought by the audience. Because the, 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 the rules I sort of said for the character is, he, he, the audience is going to have to care for him. Is going to, the audience is going to have to have the emotions of the lead character in place of the character who doesn't have them. So we, in a way, should feel like we're protecting him. Uh, so we know what the gunshots mean. He, he, he isn't, he doesn't, he just hears noises. So the constant gunshots that are going on throughout the film, we know they're dangerous. He doesn't know that. And, and, and so what should happen is you kind of build, hopefully, a, 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 a sort of, uh, like a, a caring sort of emotion for him. And, and you see other people trying to sort of see if there's anything in there that they're all trying to, they're all curious. I don't think we take it too much further than Romero did uh, with, you know, the, the, in Dawn of the Dead and, and with Bob, where they remember things and they're not sure why. So they'll gravitate towards something. And in this week, we thought the color yellow would represent a lot of things that like you see you see the coffee shop and this is kind of a bit of an amb ambiguous one i'm not sure how well how clear it lands but the coffee shop and then when you go to the howard. yeah at the at, yeah and, uh, the sherman howard reference um but then when you get to the the, the house at the end uh, leanne pamman who, who, who did a couple of days with us she you know her name you, her, on her name tag you see that she works at that coffee shop and so there's just little things like that i thought would be Oddly, I got a lot of it from Labyrinth. <laughs> you see, like at the end of Labyrinth, all the fun little creatures she played with, you see toys of them in her in her living room, in her bedroom. Uh, I kind of just went down that road with it a little bit. I thought, oh, that might be quite fun. Um, and so that became the, the crux of the whole movie. And I actually, I don't think I was going to do a flashback. I never, I thought, no, I won't do that. I'll let the audience sort of figure it out. But I saw, uh, but I thought, no, you know what? I'm robbing, I'm robbing ourselves of an opportunity if we really care for this character we can essentially create an entirely new character and people will think it's the same one. Because we, when we see Colin at the end and he's a human in that flashback, we, we, we don't know that guy. We don't know that guy. That guy could have turned up and then killed her and gone, holy shit, what a twist. We were following a night and we were following a monster the whole time. He was a monster before he was a monster. And yeah, it would have been cool, but it would have been kind of a cheap, kind of crappy ending. Maybe I'll do it on the next one. Uh, but it's like, it's, it's just one of those, things I thought yeah well let's have this flashback and see if we can tell a whole new movie 
as a little climax to give it a real good emotional sort of uh, hopefully. I think it went very well. Yeah, yeah, it went yeah. very well. I think because, like I say, you root, like Chad said, you're sort of rooting for Colin throughout the movie, and then at the end, you get to see the, the actual human side of him. Yeah. And, um, and then obviously, you sort of, you know, you just sort of put the two characters together, kind of thing, and it makes it a bit more real. And that's why I mentioned mm -hmm. Threads, because, like I say, Threads deals with human emotions of, of a disaster, which is what Colin does as well, because the party. You know, when people are sort of, you know, trying to climb to safety and things like that, you know, you see that 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 sort of panic in them in their heads, you know, and the the utter horror that is before them, and that's why yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I've got very similar vibes from it. I mean, obviously, you didn't watch Threads at the time, so to create that kind of environment for the movie, and then for it to come across still like that, I thought that was really important. Well, I think when I saw Threads, and and I, I know what you mean. I think uh, in my as I was watching it, I I think when I finished watching Threads. I tell you the bit that really affected me in that film was uh, the the kids in the next generation. I don't know why, but there's a as a I kind of I, I kind of feel quite strongly about young people having opportunities to become creatives. Uh, that's something. I, so we have a lot of young people working on our films. We always sort of employ them, and they come in. They come in to be uh, sort of production assistants. But we end up saying, "You want to work in the camera department? You do that." And and with the last few films we've done uh, with Michelle Parkins, my producer she is you know she'll make the coffee you know whilst the the production assistants get real valuable experience clapper loading or, or working with the sound department um so uh, I, I so i feel quite sort of passionate about looking out for a, a be for you know just for young people who want to get into film because i don't feel like i had that i felt i had to just sort of grab a camera and make something and even then you know it's not like anyone started like bashing my doors down to say hey let's give you some money to make movies because you know uh, like what happened with, say, Gareth Edwards, for example, if you look at Monsters, our films don't even fucking compete or compare. Like, <laughs> like Monsters is a real film. <laughs> it's like, so it's kind of like some my, my little cheap camcorder movie thing. It's like, oh, that's this. Yeah, it's. Uh, but I think that with um, I, I, I think that it, with that in mind, with threads, the thing with the generation of kids who lose education, the ability to speak. That really affected me. And when the film finished, I think I cried for about 15 minutes because I was just so shocked at the realism of that. And I was like, we just need healthy people to cultivate the land so we can eat. And, and it just got right back to basics. And, I, and, and what was lost was all this, like this, the, next, the, the next few generations were just decimated in terms of like what was there for them. And I just was like, fuck, like, like I'd never... As much as I'd looked into nuclear war stuff, because you know it's a good subject for some interesting stories, and there's stories in that scenario I want to tell. Um, I finally got around to watching Threads, and I was like, "Yeah, this this is this is how you tell this story." And I think with the war game, which came before Threads, and and Threads, I think there needs to be. I think every thirty years is kind of good to have something. Uh, every twenty or thirty years, it's good to have something. And I kind of feel like, yeah, I can, especially with the current climate of politics and really, really dumb people being in charge of kind of like, hey, this is the best time to put the shits of people with a nuclear holocaust story. This is like, realistic I'm as we can. <laughs> well, the thing about threads was like it was shown in schools in the UK yeah. during, during the mid 80s. And wow. like, I'm watching this movie as a 37, 36 year old. And I was just like, I can't cope here. So I can't, I mean, yeah. maybe obviously kids back then were a bit more differently you know, sort of really built, built, you know, <laughs> they could probably handle something like that. But if I was going home and tell my parents, oh, I just see the phone called Threads and they have what, and they watched it with me. They're yeah. thinking, you know, can I, I better be in the school then and find out what kind of education they're trying to teach you. That film is harrowing. Yeah. That's the yeah. best way to describe a harrowing. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was, um, that was, well, we're, we're sort of the generation who had all the adverts, like, don't go getting your Frisbee out of that, uh, power station or if you touch and then kids are getting fried in commercials to scare us away from yeah. doing dangerous things so uh so yeah threads sort of had a lot of that going on in it i guess but um yeah and, and i think one of the things when i watched it i i did sort of go oh well this works really well despite you know like i guess the because it's a it's on blu-rays so it's been really cleaned up it is, yeah. I don't it's been, been cleaned up now and yeah it just feels a lot like i guess it, 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 there's there's a there's a lovely sort of quality to it that is of its time, and I I always knew that Colin would have that. And as I was watching it, I was like, oh, I really hope that Colin is a bit like this for people, but I won't know because I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> I'm too scared because <laughs> I'm worried I'm just going to look at everything and go, oh my god, I didn't because I did not know what I was doing. It was all just like having grown up watching films and and, and wanting to achieve certain emotional beats, and and that was where I'd, I'd, I'd steered 
the whole thing. Uh, you can kind of feel that on the film, though. Like, you yeah. feel like it's, it's, there's a lot of pa- You can tell it's made by someone that loves, like, zombie movies and Romero. Like, like we were saying before, like, the coffee shop being called Sherman's. As soon as I seen yeah. that, I was like, obviously, that's the guy who plays Bob. The yeah. day that that's a knock yeah. to that, and it just reminded me a lot of it like 28 days later, like the way it was shot, and there was just so many bits. And like, him, like the uh, the, I don't know if you intentionally did this, but I like the uh, the little subtle hints of comedy, yeah. like the bit oh, where yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Stairs, like folks, the zombie on the head, the pan that made me giggle. I, I'm a 26 year old man, I should have laughed as hard as I did, but I laughed at it. I thought that's I... hilarious, man. Bonk, the zombie on the head, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The humor's all intentional, I think humor's key. Uh, I think you need humour to kind of get in uh, humour's access to to a character, and uh, and it's hard when you've got a zombie who is not something you can relate to uh, generally. Um, so that's why you know you do all this really slow build to see what he looks like, and because you know for the first part of him he's just basically it's all a physical performance and and kind of pale skin, uh, and and I and I knew that I, and I think look I, it's partly an insecurity I think when I wanted to reveal him and we see him a little bit more clearly after we see him sort of reflected in the black portion of a snakes on the plane poster, which I think you can just about catch. Um, so then he falls out the window and, and it's kind of like a goofy moment. It's, it's kind of quite, I don't know, it, it was designed to be quite funny and it was always quite nice to hear that laugh when, when I saw it in cinemas. And, and I thought, yeah, that's a nice, that, that's where we want to be with this. You want to you wanna get everyone into it, then we can start, now start exploring the world. And, and I also wanted to, I was also aware of the fact that because of the, 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 the low quality of the film, people might think, oh, it's just going to be this dude in, his, in, his, in this house all the whole time. And I wanted to sort of surprise people by taking her out into the streets and, and uh, doing stuff like that, so. It was certainly, sorry, no, no, it was, it was certainly made out, like I say, a perfect time as well, because in, between 2000 and 2010, you know, you had 28 Days Later, where it really did you know, rejuvenate the, um, the zombie genre. Shaun of the Dead obviously brought back all those, you know, like sort of like, for me, it was like, you know, um, our generation's American Wealth in London sort of thing. And then obviously you had Romero come back with Land of the Dead. Yeah. So something like Colin was like you know, the perfect sort of, you know, perfect timing for it, really. There was a, a lovely zombie reconnaissance. Uh, my washing machine is just going crazy here, by the way. Uh, I'm only here because it's close to the router and it doesn't cut off. <laughs> so no, no, it's, no, no, I never heard it. No, oh, yeah. Because <laughs> 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 it's uh, this room shaking now. I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but I think that, yeah, we had sort of something like a little zombie reconnaissance, didn't we, in, in, the, in, yeah. in the noughties. And uh, yeah, I, was, I, I kind of felt we were quite lucky to, to have that. And, um, and it was a whole filmmaking revolution. I actually think there's a thing that's happening right, right now and it's just not been discovered yet where like the democratization of filmmaking tech has been around since like the, since, since about, let's say 2005, 2006. And then you get YouTube, and Vimeo. There are so many features that are made out there that just no one got to see because for whatever reason they weren't picked up by a distributor in the traditional sense. But now I think, well, like those films are out there and I really, really hope that in about five, 10 years time, they're discovered and, and shared and like, hey, did you see this film? You know, uh, this, uh, and, and uh, you know, they're, 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 it'd just be great if all these films that people were making and then they just kind of sat there and, and didn't do, did, didn't get the distribution, distribution that was probably hoped for. Uh, they show up online and then those movies live there forever and people can see them now. And I, there's something about that that I think, I'm really hoping that's the thing that happens because we got lucky with Colin. We, we just got lucky. Um, but there's, there's so many other movies that are, that are, that are better that, that are out there that we've not seen because, you know, they, they didn't happen to land during a global economic crisis and someone thought it would be quirky to run a story about a film that cost 50 quid that was made in a bedroom in Tooting, you know? Uh, that was all that happened with us. And, and the, what followed up from that was that someone decided that uh, they would watch the film and like, oh, actually there's something in this film. That's all that happened. You know, it was, someone, it was a quirky story and then someone just, someone watched the film and thought, oh, there's something, there's something in this. And, and it got distribution. And then, you know, you got publications like Sight and Sound saying really kind things about the film and like Scorsese saying really nice things about the film. So all those things end up being quite, uh, you know, they help you out. A lot, I think. Well, it's, it's an exciting time, I think, for British horror because you've had like movies like Saint Maud, 
Robert Eggers, The Witch, and then the, the recent one with Sensor that's just come out. And then, oh, yeah, Pranos film, yeah, yeah. I've not seen it myself yet, but like I said, there's a lot of people talking about it. And like I say, it's getting British, not just British cinema, but British horror. Because like, like I mentioned before, like the resurgence in 2000 era, like, you know, it wasn't yeah, yeah. just um, zombies, but you had like Neil Marshall came in with Dog Soldiers yeah, yeah. And, the, and The Descent. And then yeah, yeah. sort of like, so it, I mean, are you hoping to go back into the horror genre at all? Or? Um, yeah, we've got like, there's a, there's a, I've wanted to do a Christmas one for a really long time. Because, wow. um, uh, uh, and, and I, as an actor friend of mine, Michael Geary, and I'm, I'm constantly uh, saying to him, ah, man, I want to do a Christmas movie, I want to do a Christmas movie. I think we hit on an idea that we're really happy with. Um, so I think we're going to sort of develop that and see if we can get that going. We need like a little bit more of a budget. We might have to shoot it in Canada if we get it together. But yeah, we'll, we'll see where that goes. But yeah, so there's, so there's there's lots of stuff I think we want to do in horror. I think I want to do a horror action movie. Uh, that's something I've always, because I'm, I'm doing, because I love doing action. I've always loved action. And in Colin, we had to do it in a, like the reason like some of the action is quite frenetic is because uh, like none of my mates could act and we couldn't do fight scenes, we couldn't do it safely. We didn't really have fake crowbars, it was a fucking real crowbar. So what they do is they would just do all of this stuff. And if the camera does that with them, you can kind of get, uh, you get it feels more threatening and dangerous than it is because the quality of the film, there's something when you see a film that it, it feels like it's unmoderated. It feels like we could do anything. We could pull any sick shit out of thin air and throw it into this film. And there's something about that that you're sort of aware of when you see a film that's clearly made on a certain level. And the trick is how far do you push that? And I think with us, we pushed it quite far with the basement scene. And, but in that instance, I was very much like, I, I don't wanna, I just wanna imply stuff and let people bring their own fears to the table and, and see how grim and dark it feels. And um, yeah, and it was quite interesting because I spoke to a few people about that and they came away with some interesting theories. I'm like, well, I, I don't state or even imply that in the film. Um, but what I do want is for you to project your own fears into that, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, the, 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 kind of yeah scariest, the kind of scariest part for me and Colin was the uh, the bit when all, they're all fighting the cool guy with the slingshot with the, the razor blade. He, <laughs> he was a cool guy, I'm just saying that right now. And then obviously some of them get bit and they all decide to get, and you can see them all like cowering that. I thought that was like very like nerve wracking because obviously you've got like, a woman crying and they all just sort of like, because no one wants to kill these people because they're obviously friends or whatever. And then they just beat them to death. And I thought that was like, because I, I thought the, the bit with the bloke in the basement, I thought oh, that's pretty creepy. But I thought the most terrifying part was watching what humans would do to other humans. Yeah. 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 So with oh. the with the um, with the people that you use, so so because obviously when I watch like a low budget movie sort of thing, because some because I you know, I love characters in movies, and the first thing I always look for is like you know the acting abilities and sort of things. When I know about low budget low budget movies, and like I say when I was making, I can't watch back my college films, even though I'm quite proud of them because even though they were nothing that special, but I still look back at them and think you know not bad for someone who didn't have anything. You, you know, made really... something that's that's something to be celebrated. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, exactly. But uh, when I was watching Colin, though, I generally thought, you know, you, you, you had a great team with you. I thought, like I said, I looked at the acting. I thought, no, one, there's no real false notes here. They're all everyone's on the game. I think what that was, and I can, I, I appreciate that much more now. That um, I, I I was friends with a lot of actors who went to Lambda. So, uh, and what would happen is because of the age we were when we were making the film, we were sort of. I was in my sort of. Uh, late 20s, uh, so I was like 27. And so what we did with, with that was, I would go to drama schools and say, oh, who's, who's, what's rather like, what's central like, what's uh, Lambda, Aura. Um, and so, you know, and I got to learn the, that there are amazing actors in London who all sort of know each other. And what I did, what I always do with the films I make is I try to get people in and it's like, I want to hear their voice. I want to hear what they want to bring to it because their instincts are going to be, I want this to feel real and whatever techniques they have, they're able to bring that. And so with Alistair, he, you know, he'd done a few years at Lambda. So he understood body language and physicality. He knew it wasn't about lines. He's a, he's a massive fan of film and uh, a, a very intelligent audience. So he knows what you can do to really convey stuff with very little. And, and I was like, hey, well, this is what I'm going to do with a close-up. And if we do that with a close-up, we're combining both of those things. And the camera becomes 
something that works with an actor and not something that just captures an actor. And that's why I think I was more drawn to making a film than a found footage movie. Because the, the, although the car camera is a character, it's a very present character that you're aware of. But in, um, I think in, 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 a, in a movie, you, you're not necessarily as aware of the, char of the, of the camera as a character. And you, you sort of run with it a little bit more and it's able to manipulate you a little bit more. And, and, and that's all I, I wanted to be able to do really was to just manipulate people's emotions. And, you know, I, mean, I, think, I think it comes across pretty well in the movie because like I say, that was not, it was like I say, every time I watch a zombie movie, I just expect gore, you know, I always expect that type of thing. And even though of course that is, there's elements of that in the movie, yeah. but the human side of things, which, are, which I always look for in a film, because I think that sometimes, you know, it makes it, you know, you, you connect with it more. And Colin yeah. definitely does that. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. That's really kind, guys. And a lot of it, a lot of the effects as well, is just us with a, a, a mug of fake blood that we made, just throwing mm -hmm. it at someone. Like it's uh, sometimes you put some some mints in there, it looks even more disgusting. <laughs> and you just throw that on on my mates that let me throw blood on them. I mean, there's God. There was one bit in it, like we're, we're literally just like spitting blood on the street. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> It's like, yeah, that works. You know, we tried all these things, all these, like, this is before we knew where a pango gun was. Um, so we were just like, you know, just finding ways to spray stuff. And I went, you know what, give me that. <laughs> and that was how we did some of this stuff. And uh, lots of mints and gum to make up for the spitting of... Uh, That's good advice. If Chad and I ever go into the film industry, we know... Stop that. spitting blood at me. And stop buying, and stop <laughs> buying mints. Well, we, we've got a scene in the film we're doing. Uh, we start next week. And in that, there's a scene in the script where someone spits on someone. It's like, you literally wrote this last year, Mark. Why, why would you write someone spitting on anyone in a, on a COVID safe <laughs> shoot? And I went, oh man, yeah, of course. So that's gone from working with actors and saying, look, you know, how, how do we do this in a way where it's hygienic and, and okay, you know, people spit on each other in films, it's a thing that happens. But I was like, oh, we can't do that now. Now it has to be a special effect. And so I've got to work out different, I've got a pango gun. Do you know what a pango gun is? It's like a blue, Gun is for clearing um, stuff out your sink, basically. Yes. Yeah, and, I don't know but you, you pump it up, you get some real pressure behind it, you put some dust in it, and you shoot, and then you can suddenly make it look like a bullet has just hit off screen and stuff, or you can spray blood everywhere. We, we did it in Night Shooters so when a character gets shot through the neck, and uh, the, the blood sort of the bullet goes right through and it sprays blood all over the glass. Um, and, and all we did so was just there with a pango gun behind the actor going, pew, and spitting blood in the glass, and it looked great. And and um, there's yeah, so I think that in, in so we've got to do that now with this with this film. So I'm just gonna get it so I don't hurt our stunt guy by blasting him too hard in the face with phlegm. <laughs> so yeah, so it's uh... obviously um, on your IMDb, you've got you're quite uh, diverse in the films you do. Uh, I've noticed you've done like a, a western, which is pretty cool. But uh, like uh, yeah, we've done a western. <laughs> so I, I'm the I think was it a western? You've done? It was a Western, yeah, it was a Western. Yeah. We, we, Which I think is pretty cool. I, I, when I was young, I liked uh, all the Clint Eastwood ones, also with my dad. Thought, that was pretty cool. You done like, was it, um, you said the age of Dune Drifter? Dune Drifter, yeah, was yeah. It, I, 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 really I really enjoyed that. that. So, yeah, well done on that one as well, Mark. Nice, that, was, that was a very cool little film. We shot half of that in this room. We built oh, the spaceship really? here. Yeah, the spaceship was built right here. We had rear, uh, we had rear projection and front projection because um, there was nowhere else to build it. I think uh, we, we had an opportunity to do it at Long Cross Studios, but the shooting schedule was a little bit tricky. And, the, and we had a gimbal and everything uh, for it that, that was going to be loaned to us by Neil Corbold, uh, the sort of special effects master who works on all Ridley Scott films, all Spielberg films, he's in the UK. Uh, he did uh, like all, his brother does all the, the main Star Wars films. He does all the spin-offs. Um, like, so he did Rogue One. So we're just like, okay. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you can build your set on this. Uh, it's like a gimbal we, we, we had for uh, a BA commercial. And yeah, we can sh shake it around and it was cool. It was like, but uh, yeah, it just, it just wasn't something we could pull together in time. And so I just said, look, we're gonna have to do it the old Star Trek way and just film it here and just shake the camera when things get tense in the spaceship and uh, get the actors to bounce around their seats. Um, Daisy, who played Colin's sister, is in that as well. She plays the, I didn't uh, know the pilot. That yeah. Brackets, yeah. Yeah, she's fantastic. Um, actually, yeah, Colin, 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 Colin. Yeah. Alistair's in that as well. He, uh, he's the general at the beginning who's like telling them what they have to do in the space battle. So we got Alistair Curtin, who plays Colin, to play. Uh, he, he did a little cameo in it as well. Quite a few people from Colin popped up in that. He's mates with a lot of them still. Um, yeah. In fact, randomly, I, I, I spoke to someone 
who I saw online as, and I was asking her something, I can't remember where it was. And it turns out that I hadn't actually spoken to her since we'd finished the film. And she was like, oh my God, it's going, it's going really well. Congratulations. I was like, I haven't spoken to you in 10 years. <laughs> We've just been catching up. It's, uh, yeah, it's a really, it's, it's, I, I, it's one of the, Colin's the most special film for me in that, like, it's where I, I think I really learned a lot about making film. I learned about how you, uh, how, like, you get the best out of people by really encouraging them and not doing all the sort of stomping and shouting that you see other, like you, you see, cause it's, cause it's, it's, a, it's good for documentaries, you know, people tense, it's good for documentaries. So you see a lot of that stuff, but I've just never found it to be a productive way to get people to work. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's better to show appreciation. And, and it's um, great to give, like I say, an actor and um, more freedom in, in the role. Cause like I say, if they read, I mean, sometimes, you know, you see it in many, many films where you know, director or writer will write the script and then they'll show it to the actor and then the actor will obviously, you know, take it on and then they will sometimes bring something to the table as well, which maybe the writer and director never even thought of. Yeah, because, and, and, yeah, and it's, that's, that's the best thing. I think that it's uh, like, it's like you've seen the movie up here, but let's try and find a better one. And the better movie is when everyone else contributes. And uh, I think that's, that's, the, that's the way I've all sort of looked at it. And I mean, like when it came to like Night Shooters and, and Doom Drifter, Doom Drifter was, the, I think, the hardest film we've done. I think um, we we really looked at that. Like, we were really looking at that and going, "This is this is really difficult." Uh, but it was all right. I mean, the the crew were absolutely fantastic, and uh, the problem solving, the level of problem solving we had in that film is was was crazy. Um, from visual effects, down, and we always had an idea of what we were going to do. It wasn't a case that we're going to do this and we have no idea because you know the film was financed and we made it for sixty thousand. And, um, but the, the weird, the weird thing is that the, the distributors has kind of released the wrong version of the film. <laughs> they kind of, there's, there was a censored cut that they said, this would be fine for certain streaming services. And I was just like, hey, as long as my version ends up here, here and here, whatever, you guys do your thing. Yeah, 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 we'll, we'll do that. And then my version didn't even end up on the DVD. You put the DVD in, my cut of the film is a special feature. And the censored version makes no sense. There's loads of plot points that are missing and it's kind of weird. So the link that I sent you, that's the right version. If there's opening credits at the front of the film, yeah. that's the right version. Oh, good, that's what I watched that. <laughs> oh, good, yeah, yeah. If there's not, then... Uh, uh, but So I've just said to anyone who wants to watch it, I'd rather them watch my version, just DM me and I'll just send you the link. And also there's a making of as well, which is quite fun, that shows how we did it. Seven days in Iceland, uh, I think a week here and, a, and two days in my friend's garden. <laughs> and that was it, that would be made with, because I didn't want any green screen. Because not that I'm opposed to green screen or visual effects or anything like that. It's just that I, I see a lot of low budget um, sort of sci-fis and, and I don't want to look, I don't want it to look like we shot it in like a garage with a green wall. I, I wanted it to feel, tangible and real so we, we looked into locations and and michelle parkin my amazing producer said you've got what you can have seven days in iceland seven shoot days and i went oh okay okay i'll write something i could do in seven days then so because we had a very odd way where the the pitch was approved now i didn't know this i didn't know there was a dune film being made but i think because i called it dune drifter the distributed eyes were like oh yeah we can we can we can work with that. Yeah, make that. Who gives a shit what it turns out like? <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so we had that sort of thing. And so, um, so we made it. And then, uh, yeah, then the, the, the unfortunate, because it did so well in festivals. Um, like, it was like, but yeah, then it was sold to people who, <laughs> so it sold to people who, so people who thought it was a different <laughs> film. <laughs> when Dennis Fielder's Jew comes out next month, then I reckon you're going to see a lot more of your film being put onto the shelves again. Uh, it's going to be a load more angry people. When people when people are dumb enough to think that my movie is fucking Dune, I wouldn't be yelling about it on the internet. <laughs> I'd be like, oh shit, I feel stupid. I'll keep that one to myself. Toss it in the bin. <laughs> like maybe. But uh, yeah, uh, but I've actually had uh, really, really nice, uh, lovely uh, messages from people who have seen it. And I kind of lament and go, ah, no, that was the wrong version. Here's the link to the real version. And also here is a making of link as well. So uh, hope I am yet to see it. So I'm going to have to DM yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Whichever, whichever is best, as long as I can watch it. But I'll try and watch it around the same time as two as well, though. Make it a bit of a, make it a, bit of a, <laughs> a, double, a double feature, perhaps. 
Yeah, it's like you get lovely, beautiful, delicious feast that is going to be the Dune movie, and then you get like a crappy Snickers for dessert, which is probably mine. I'm ready for all that. <laughs> I'm going to wave the flag for you, Mark. <laughs> I, say a, I say a crappy Snickers. Sorry, that's a bit. No, it's a, a fucking Caramac. I made a Caramac. <laughs> Higher end chocolate. <laughs> No, this, I think this is what quite they're probably still 10p, aren't they, Caramax? <laughs> right, I think this brings us to the end of our, our episode, Mark. Just want to thank you to you for coming and oh, yeah, oh. speaking to us. And we hope everything you do in the future works out really well. Oh, thank you. And, and yeah, I've been speaking to you. It's so nice talking about Colin. I haven't talked about it in, in, in this much detail in such a long time. So it's kind of it's kind of brilliant and really nice. I'm glad, glad you're happy, mate. Yeah, we really like Colin. And for anybody yeah. who's watching this, remember, it's Amazon. on Amazon Prime. So you can watch it anytime you want. Uh, I tell you something quite fun, actually, is that Alistair Curtin was literally... He, he lives in Leeds uh, now. So he... he he was staying here last night, so me and him were, were having a good old catch up. We hadn't been in the same room for a while, so um, yeah, and yeah, and uh, so yeah, so he was here. So it's been a good old Colin fucking recap for me. It's great, <laughs> it's lovely. Good, Mark. Yeah, th again, thanks for coming on, mate. And uh, yeah, we'll speak to you soon. Thanks, Mark. Well, that was amazing. Thank you, Mark. Very, very good uh, guest. Really enjoyed that. Uh, again, I know we've said this twice already, but go check out Colin on yeah, Amazon Prime. Check out it. everything that Mark's done because it all looks like great fun. Gene Drifter is really fun. I'm going to check out his Western because I'm a, I'm a fucker for a rest of Western. So that, that'll be good. Uh, so, yeah, um, is there anything else you want to say, Rob? Are oh, we going to say goodbye to our lovely viewers? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>